Module 1, When You Are Aware Believe nothing, no matter where you have read it or who has said it, not even if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. Buddha The truth will set you free. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no secret is revealed. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Solon decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. Confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. But first, it will make you miserable. President James Garfield Our greatest power is to focus the mind on one thing for an extended period of time. Albert Einstein A mind that is expanded by a new idea will never go back to its original dimension. Oliver Wendell Holmes Our world is changing. Our jobs, our money, our government, even our fellow citizens. A paradigm shift in everything that you know is happening right now. This paradigm shift occurs once in a lifetime. It is a paradigm shift that will most likely define who you are and how you will be remembered. This paradigm shift will affect every aspect of your life. Your relationships, your finances, your health, your security, your very freedom. The truth is incontrovertible. Panic may resent it. Ignorance may deride it. Malice may distort it. But there it is. Winston Churchill After this paradigm shift, there will be no American middle class. When the music stops, that is where you and your family will be for the better part of your life. At the top or at the bottom. Most will be taken completely by surprise. Shock, anger, resentment, depression, poverty. But a small few will be ready, educated, prepared, and ready to thrive. The greatest generation 
was born into the Great Depression, fought valiantly during World War II, and created a whole new world for us to live in. They did this by sacrifice and overcoming odds. Are we really ready? Look at the differences in the paths to success, then and now. Back then, it was hard manual labor. Now, it is speculation. Back then, honesty and reputation ruled. Now, it is about the scam and the quick buck. Back then, they had a large supportive family that all worked together. Now, people avoid marriage and or children. Back then, it was what you knew. Now, it is who you knew. Back then, innovation and in, in building things. Now, it's about marketing. Back then, we built factories. Now, we offshore factories. Back then, we ran, ran a tight ship. Now, we give bailouts to everybody. Back then, people had equity in their assets. Now, everybody has debt. Back then, they knew how to sacrifice. Now, everybody's about instant gratification. We have been collectively silenced and bought off with our lifestyle. We buy now and pay later. Our lives are about daily distractions, work, sports, soap operas, elections, celebrity gossip, fashion, personal dramas, etc. I'm going to read you a quick little story from The Creature of Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. The story is told of a New England farmer with a small pond in his pasture. Each summer, a group of wild ducks would frequent that pond, but try as he would, the farmer could never catch one. No matter how early in the morning he approached, or how carefully he constructed a blind, or what kind of duck, he, duck call he tried, somehow those crafty birds sensed danger and managed to be out of range. Of course, when the fall arrived, the ducks headed south, and the farmer's craving for a duck dinner only intensified. Then he got an idea. Early in the spring, he started scattering corn along the edge of the pond. The ducks liked corn, and since it was always there, they soon gave up on dipping and foraging for their own food. After a while, they became used to the farmer and began to trust him. They could see that he was their benefactor and that they now walked close to him with no sense of fear. Life was easy. They forgot how to fly, but that was unimportant because now they were so fat that they couldn't, they couldn't have gotten off the water even if they tried. Fall came and the ducks stayed. Winter came and the pond froze. The farmer built a shelter to keep them warm. The ducks were happy because they didn't have to fly and the farmer was especially happy because each week all dinner long he had a delicious duck dinner. That is the story of America's Great Depression of the 1930s and our future. Think about the process of domesticating wild horses. You gain their trust, you feed them and take care of them, then they are yours. It is the same process that you would domesticate wild Americans give them jobs, take care of them, then they are yours. Rock the boat. As long as everything is fine, people don't rock the boat. Everyone is fat, happy, and distracted. No one questions anything or looks at the big picture. It is only when the tide goes out that you can see who has been swimming naked. Warren Buffett 
What happens when our collective boat is heading into danger? Get off the sinking ship. That is what the elite are doing. You make plans, they make plans. You may have a plan to get out of debt, lose weight, or get a job promotion. Small business owners may have weekly meetings with their staff to plan for success. Large companies have business plans, strategists, marketing departments, legal guidance, and financial directors. Why is it so hard to believe that powerful people might get together and have a plan to protect their interests? The elite own all of the important land, all of the corporations, all of the natural resources, all of the media, and they even own the politicians to rig the game in their favor. The elite's plan is simple. More for them, less for you. Here's a quote from Professor Carol Quigley, who spent years studying the elite and had unprecedented access to their files and published them all in a book called Tragedy and Hope. He said that the elite are planning nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. Conspiracy A secret plan or arrangement between two or more people to commit illegal and subversive acts. If the elite are planning to protect their assets through rigging political systems, rigging the stock market, um, and other means, that is a conspiracy. But anyone trying to, to get out of the system to avoid this paradigm shift or point out these crimes is branded a kook, a nut, or a conspiracy theorist. Why do people choose to take the easy route and accept the government version of events when they lie all of the time? The answer is simple. Most information is withheld from the, from the public and ignorance is bliss. In times of universal deceit, telling the truth will be a revolutionary act. George Orwell We are supposed to think that all events are accidental, coincidental, and because of that, we think that there is nothing we can do about it. In politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet that it was planned that way. Franklin Roosevelt Think outside of the cell. As humans, we naturally look at anyone outside of our group or world view as dangerous and to be shunned. This served us well when we lived in a tribal, small community dynamic. Now we are systematically and scientifically misled in order to serve the better interests of others. We need to look outside our own little world for answers if the community is headed for collapse. Have you ever seen crabs in a shallow bucket? If you put one crab in a bucket, it can easily get out. But if there is more than one crab, any crab trying to get out will be pulled back into the bucket by the rest of the crabs. And that is our society. This paradigm shift can be something to fear or something to prepare for. What does it take to be ready? The answer is very simple. An open mind.
Let them march all they want, so long as they pay their taxes. Alexander Haig Don't believe them. Don't fear them. Don't ask anything of them. Alexander Solzhenitsyn I watched all these tea parties get together and march on Washington. It was impressive, and there's a lot of um, great signs that they put up there. They definitely made a political statement, and this is the beginning of something big for the Tea Party as an alternative to the de false left-right um, Democrat and Republican political spectrum that we live in. But the game is rigged, and nothing will change with elections, protests, marches, editorials, or even tea parties. They are important, but they will not change the system. It is very important for you to understand that. Think of when you, when you became an adult. Your parents did not respect you until you acted independently from them. You ever see this the sign? Teenagers, tired of being harassed by your parents? Act now. Move out, get a job, pay your own way while you still know everything. That is the same thing a responsible citizen must do against its repressive government. So the sign should read, Citizens, tired of being harassed by your government? Act now. Get out of the dollar, get out of debt, educate yourself, buy gold, guns, and grub while you still can. The Secret to Life Why are Americans so depressed? There's an estimated 40 million Americans that are on some sort of antidepressants, and if we include the amount of Americans that abuse alcohol and other drugs, the numbers are probably double that. We have a high standard of living, we have relative safety, we have big houses and nice cars. Do you want to know what is the secret to happiness? Progress. We know that we're not getting anywhere. Think about it. When were you most happy? Our childhood. And why? Because every day was new and full of possibility. A healthy family structure provides a safe environment for a child to reach their full potential. This potential leads to a child taking action. By taking action, they get results. When they get results, they get certainty. And once they have certainty, they feel the potential for anything, and it repeats over and over again. Confident people succeed, and confident people have certainty that they're going to get things done because they have a proven track record of continually making things happen. Question everything. the point completely. Not important to get children to read. Children who want to read are going to read. Kids who want to learn to read are going to learn to read. Much more important to teach children to question what they read. Children should be taught to question everything. To question everything they read, everything they hear. Children should be taught to question authority. Parents never teach their children to question authority because Parents are authority figures themselves and they don't want to undermine their own bullshit inside the household. So they stroke the kid and the kid strokes them and they all stroke each other and they all grow up all fucked up and they come to shows like this. Kids have to be warned that there's bullshit coming down the road. That's the biggest thing you can do for a kid. Tell them what life in this country is about. It's about a whole lot of bullshit that needs to be detected and avoided. That is the late, great George Carlin. Question everything 
If something is presented to you, you must ask, why is this being presented to me? To whose benefit does this benefit? Does it make me a better person or does it have me do something that benefits somebody else? If you question everything, it'll take you down the right path and it possibly keep you out of danger. Judge a man by his questions rather than his answers. Voltaire. Think if we just applied that quote to our politicians, how different would our lives be? We're always asking questions of uh, the politicians and they always give us the answer we want to hear and they yet they never do it. I'd much rather have a politician who questions why things are the way that they are, question why we live the way we live, and question how we can change it. I don't want his answers. I want him. I want somebody there to ask the questions. Our family structure is broken. The Industrial Revolution took the father out of the house. The Consumer Revolution took the mother out of the house. It takes two or three incomes to support a family now. Who is left to shape the minds of our children? And who benefits from this? Qui bono. If you don't know what qui bono is, it is what the Roman Senate uh, asked when Caesar was murdered on the Ides of our March. They asked who benefits from this? And that is one of the most important things you could possibly ask. Qui bono. Who benefits from this? The state fills the void. Our society is mass producing pathological narcissism on a massive scale. This narcissism will be seen as fascination with fame and celebrity, fear of competition, the inability to suspend belief, shallowness and transitory nature and the quality of personal relationships? We know deep down we are not getting ahead. We are presented saviors who never change the system or solve any of the problems. And our future is not certain. This generation will be the first American generation not to live as well as the previous generation. This, unfortunately, has been designed to happen this way. We have been programmed all of our life to shut out our own personal choices and to conform with society. This could be in the form of your parents' authority, the school's rules, social pressure, or the government laws and regulation. By the time we're adults, we have a self-regulating prison of our own mind. We recognize the symptoms, self-doubt, low self-esteem, lack of motivation, lack of original ideas. We think we know the cause of these problems. Our parents, the educational system, the media, maybe even the boss. When in reality, they are just victims of the very same dynamic. I'm pro! <laughs> I'm going pro! Oh, oh! Okay. Yeah. I don't know. You know, uh, you'll probably be about as good as I was. That's kind of the way it works, you know, and I, I, I was below average. You know, so, whoa. So you'll probably ultimately rank somewhere around there, you know, so... Really, you'll excel at a lot of things, just not this. I don't want you out here shooting this ball around all day and night, all right? All right. Okay? All right, go ahead.
Hey. Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Not even me. All right? All right. You got a dream? You got to protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. You want something, go get it. Period. That is uh, Will Smith and his son from The Pursuit of Happiness. I've watched that scene probably a hundred times and I still get chills. Um, it's a perfect example of how society, whether it's your parent, um, the structure, people who won't tell you you can't and that cannot happen. And as a whole, a society can put this in through our media, through our values, um, through our lifestyle and constantly crush what God has put into us. And it's, it doesn't need to be that way. And we need to get back to not only make it happen for our own selves and our own lives, um, and at the very least, don't pass it down to the next generation. Let them dream. Let them be what they can be. Um, don't let them stop them. Let them know that society's going to tell them they can't, and they still need to push forward. Uh, a very powerful scene. The typical American is programmed through society to obey authority, follow the rules, and don't ask questions. We are to conform to society and also to go into debt. Credit cards, student loans, mortgage payments, car payments. The lower class is programmed to either depend on the government or work for the government. The middle class is programmed to prepare for corporate jobs and get into debt to have the American dream. The system is designed for us to be just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork, but not smart enough to ask questions like, is this really the best system for us? Around, I look around. I see a lot of new faces. <laughs> Shut up! Which means a lot of you have been breaking the first two rules of Fight Club. Man, I see in Fight Club the strongest and smartest men who've ever lived. I see all this potential. And I see it squandered. God damn it, an entire generation pumping gas, waiting tables, slaves with white collars. Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars. But we won't. We're slowly learning that fact. And we're very, very pissed off. It is Tyler Durden from Fight Club. Um, if you haven't seen Fight Club, watch it again. If you've seen it and you thought it was just a, you know, a, a guy movie about beating each other up, watch it again. Um, it is a, 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 a movie I think that will uh, be seen 20 years from now as a, a very uh, prescient movie about uh, my generation, Generation X, uh, and coming to the reality that the dream that we've been sold um, from the baby boomer generation. Um, is that just a dream? Um, 
the concept of chasing consumerism and and becoming a slave to to feed this consumerism um, is a reality that we need to wake up from. Um, whether we do it ourselves now, willingly, when we still have the time and the resources to do it, or this will come to an end when the paradigm shift happens. When the United States is no longer able to print the world's reserve currency, when the 5% of the American population can no longer use 25% of the world's oil and up to 50% of other uh, world's resources, our lives are unsustainable and things that cannot last forever won't. Education is dangerous. Every educated person is a future enemy. Herman Goring Making sure that you become free and independent does not serve the elite's interest. So don't expect it. If you want it, you have got to fight for it. Shut your face. It is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong. Voltaire I am very fond of the truth, but not at all of martyrdom. Also by Voltaire. When we do ask questions, we are told to shut our face, not ask questions, obey authority. The elite keep us focused on our differences, our race, our religion, political parties, languages, ethnic background, social status, our income, and even our education levels. This is more commonly known as divide and conquer. All these hot button issues that are constantly thrown in our political um, spectrum and in the news are purposely designed to keep us divided, to find as many differences among us instead of focusing on our commonalities. The elite keep accentuating our differences to keep us looking down for the cause of our problems and not up at the architects of our problems. We should be focusing on our similarities. I bet if you were to spend a day with an Iraqi store owner, you would have more in common with that man than any of the elite that run our country. And yet, we bomb the Iraqi store owner to benefit the elite. And I tried hard to be proud of my service, but all I could feel was shame. And racism could no longer mask the reality of the occupation. These were people, these were human beings. I've since been plagued by guilt any time I see an elderly man, like the one who couldn't walk, who he rolled onto a stretcher and told the Iraqi police to take him away. I feel guilt any time I see a mother with her children, like the one who cried hysterically and screamed that we are worse than Saddam as we forced her from her home. I feel guilt any time I see a young girl, like the one I grabbed by the arm and dragged him to the street. We were told we were fighting terrorists. The real terrorist was me, and the real terrorism is this occupation. Racism within the military has long been an important tool to justify the destruction and occupation of another country. It has long been used to justify the killing, subjugation, and torture of another people. Racism is a vital weapon employed by this government. It is more important weapon than a rifle, a tank, a bomber, or a battleship. It is more destructive than an artillery shell, or a bunker buster, or a tomahawk missile. While those weapons are created and owned by this government, they are harmless without people willing to use them. Those who send us to war do not have to pull a trigger or lob a mortar round. They do not have to fight the war, they merely have to sell the war. They need a public who is willing to send their soldiers into harm's way. They need soldiers who are willing to kill and be killed without question. They can spend millions on a single bomb, but that bomb only becomes a weapon when the ranks in the military are willing to follow orders to use it. They can send every last soldier anywhere on earth, but there will only be a war if soldiers are willing to fight. 
And the ruling class, the billionaires who profit from human suffering, care only about expanding their wealth, controlling the world economy, understand that their power lies only in their ability to convince us that war, oppression, and exploitation is in our interest. They understand that their wealth is dependent on their ability to convince the working class to die to control the market of another country. And convincing us to kill and die is based on their ability to make us think that we are somehow superior. Soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen have nothing to gain from this occupation. The vast majority of people living in the U.S. have nothing to gain from this occupation. In fact, not only do we have nothing to gain, but we suffer more because of it. We lose limbs, endure trauma, and give our lives. Our families have to watch flag-draped coffins lowered into the earth. Millions in this country without health care, jobs, or access to education must watch this government squander over $450 million a day on this occupation. Poor and working people in this country are sent to kill poor and working people in another country to make the rich richer. And without racism, soldiers would realize that they have more in common with the Iraqi people than they do with the billionaires who send us to war. I threw families onto the street in Iraq, only to come home and find families thrown onto the street in this country, in this tra tragic and unnecessary foreclosure crisis. We need to wake up and realize that our real enemies are not in some distant land. They're not people whose names we don't know and cultures we don't understand. The enemy is people we know very well and people we can identify. The enemy is a system that wages war when it's profitable. The enemy is the CEOs who lay us off from our jobs when it's profitable. It's the insurance companies who deny us health care when it's profitable. It's the banks who take away our homes when it's profitable. Our enemy is not 5,000 miles away. They are right here at home. If we organize and fight with our sisters and brothers, we can stop this war, we can stop this government, and we can create a better world. That was Michael Preisner, one of the former vets that have woken up to see the reality of our world. Um, one of the few predictions I do make, uh, the 2016 elections will be inundated with young, smart men of my generation um, who have are extremely educated, wide-awake Amer American patriots uh, who will no longer go along with the status quo, uh, will be an incredible challenge. Um, and lead the next American Revolution. The reason why I say 2016 um, is because we still have to go through a lot of turmoil. The 2012 elections uh, will show some starting up of this, but I really don't believe that they'll actually take hold and take power until 2016. Um, and there's a lot of people of my generation, you start to see this pattern that this is uh, becoming when we no longer have the ability to say our generation is going to live better than the last generation, um, there will be a group of uh, people who will uh, lead the way so we can actually make maybe not a better life for our generation, but certainly for that of our children. Cognitive Dissonance The individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous he cannot believe it exists. The American mind simply has not come to a realization of the evil which has been introduced in our midst. J. Edgar Hoover The worst lies are the lies we tell ourselves. We live in denial of what we do, even what we think. We do this because we are afraid. Richard Bach I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. 
I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it is past, I will turn my inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Frank Herbert If we are merely dealing with the law of averages, half the events affecting our nation's well-being should be good for America. If we are dealing with mere incompetence, our leaders should occasionally make a mistake in our favor. We are not dealing with coincidence or stupidity, but with planning and brilliance. Gary Allen Cognitive dissonance is the uncomfortable feeling caused by holding two contradictory ideas simultaneously. An example would be uh, an animal rights activist eating meat or wearing fur. Two completely opposite ideas and one that you cannot hold inside your head without feeling an uncomfortable feeling. You can't be uh, passionate about uh, protecting animals and then go eat a cheeseburger while wearing a fur coat. But we also suffer from this cognitive dissonance on a very common level that I find unique amongst people and one that people don't like to think about. Um, but it is there. For a Republican, they could be pro-life, pro-death penalty, and pro-U.S. foreign policy. That's a, a common thing. For Democrats, they are pro-choice, anti-death penalty, and anti-war. That's a common theme. And yet both of them have dissonance. Either human life has value, all human life has value, or it does not. Either people can be redeemed, or they cannot. Um, either a, a, a child has value, an American child has value, or an Iraqi child has value. You cannot hold the Republican normal line of thinking and the Democratic line of thinking without coming up with cognitive dissidents. They are two completely opposite things. Noticing the contradiction would lead to dissonance, which could be as experienced as anxiety, guilt, shame, anger, embarrassment, or stress. The anxiety that comes from the possibility of having made a bad decision can lead to rationalization, the tendency to create additional reasons or justifications to support one's choices. Dissidence can also lead to seeking confirmation from biased sources, the denial of contradictory evidence, and many other defense, ego defense mechanisms. One day you will wake up and confront reality, or it will confront you. Rather than love, then money, then fame. Give me truth. Henry David Thoreau Rethink your life. Double think. When one believes in two contradictory beliefs at the same time, the ability to tell lies while genuinely believing in them and to forget any facts that are inconvenient. The opposite of cognitive dissonance. Advancing doublethink is the elite's defense mechanism from any challenge to their power. The elite know that propaganda will eventually be exposed. But if they could, if they could make you lie to yourself and that was accepted as truth, then they can form a new reality. Winston, you know how the party keeps power. Now tell me what. You are, you are ruling us for our own good because we are not fit to govern ourselves. 
<laughs> that was stupid, Winston. I want intelligence. The party seeks power for its own sake, not as a means, but an end. Power over the human mind, and power over all matter, climate, disease, the laws of gravity, because we control the mind. Reality is inside the skull, Winston. We control the laws of nature. The stars are not light years, but a few kilometers away. If we wished, we could blot them out here. That is power. In our world, there will be no love but the love of Big Brother, no laughter but the laugh of triumph over a defeated enemy, no art, no science, no literature, no enjoyment, but always and only, Winston, there will be the thrill of power. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. <laughs> Doublethink produces an intellectual blindness to a contradiction. Remember Baghdad Bob? Uh, he was the chief propaganda person for Saddam Hussein. And he would constantly go in front of the cameras and tell the Iraqi people that the Americans weren't here, that we were still in power, and that uh, you know they were still in control. For an American to watch this, it was almost comical. But think about it from an Iraqi perspective. Here you have a government that has completely been a tyrannical force in their lives for 20 years, just abused them. And here they are, all powerful, telling you that you know the Americans aren't here and that they're in control. For an Iraqi, they believe that and that becomes their reality. But they also, they also know that these guys lie all the time. But they accept this as fact. And while an American can see this as comical, and how can they not see through it? Doublethink is a spinning of a story to make the government look good by deliberate lies, and then simultaneously believing the new story as exact, exactly how it happened. So, again, the same concept. Them telling you a story, which you know is a lie, but then you're accepting it as reality because they're telling you. Um, that's the that's the same uh, advancement of ideas, you know, don't question authority. And once that gets drilled into you, it helps them uh, produce this double-think process. And yet, our government does the exact same thing. They're just a little bit more polished. This is done not only to mislead the populace, but more importantly, those in government. This is important because if regime participants suddenly get a conscience, the whole system could collapse. The military must believe that they are fighting for freedom while they are enslaving populations for private profit. We are an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things are going to sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left just to study what we do. Karl Rove If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such a time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie and thus by extension the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Joseph Goebbels Nazi theory indeed specifically denies that such a thing as the truth exists. The implied objective of this line of thought is a nightmare world which the leader or some ruling, ruling clique controls not only the future but the past. If the leader says such and such an event, it never happened, well, 
it never happened. If he says 2 plus 2 are 5, well, 2 plus 2 are 5. This prospect frightens me much more than bombs. George Orwell The elite tell us many lies that we know are lies, and yet we accept them as truth. Does anybody really believe the unemployment numbers? Does anybody really believe in this strong dollar policy? Does anyone really believe that we are the land of the free? It's time to tell the truth. Societal illusions. Is enough bullshit as it is? In fact, there's just enough. Did you know that? There's just enough bullshit to hold things together in this country. <laughs> bullshit is the glue that binds us as a nation. Where would we be without our safe, familiar American bullshit? Land of the free, home of the brave, the American dream. All men are equal, justice is blind, the press is free, your vote counts. <laughs> Business is honest, the good guys win. The police are on your side. God is watching you. Your standard of living will never decline. And everything is going to be just fine. The official national bullshit story. I call it the American okie doke. Every one of those items is provably untrue at one level or another, but we believe them because they're pounded into our heads from the time we're children. That's what they do with that kind of stuff. They put it in the heads of kids. They pound it in there because kids, they know kids are too young to be able to mount a sophisticated argument against these kind of ideas. And so, uh, kids, and up to a certain age, by the way, kids are going to believe everything a grown-up tells them. Everything. So, they, so kids never learn to question things. Nobody questions things in this country anymore. Nobody questions things. Why? People are too fat and happy. People are way too fucking prosperous for their own good. Everyone's got a cell phone that'll make pancakes and rub their balls now, you know? <laughs> so, nobody wants, nobody wants to rock the boat. And people, people just, uh, gizmo, Americans have been silenced, bought off and silenced by gizmos and toys. And as a result, no one's ever learned to question things. No one questions things in this country. Anymore. No one questions things. Everything is fine today. That is our illusion. Voltaire. The illusion is the first of all pleasures. Voltaire. The most potent weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Stephen Biko. Here is um, an idea I want you to, to ponder. This is uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. This is a song that we've heard thousands of times. Um, I just I want you to listen to it and read the lyrics. So that's Santa Claus is coming to town and if you start looking at it with this critical eye um, you then start to see that at a very early age we are indoctrinating children to not question authority to do as they're told and if they follow the rules they'll be rewarded now ironically this song was written in 1934 which is the at the height of the depression 
um, and during a very um, authoritarian uh, Roosevelt administration. And if you substitute Santa Claus as this authority figure here um, with either a parent um, who obviously would benefit from uh, children not crying and not pouting and, and doing what they're told and um, you know that we're constantly watching you or your government um, who would then have a child like adults who don't cry, don't pout, uh, we're watching you, we know what you're doing, we know when you're awake, uh, we know if you've been bad or good, so you just better be good without us watching. Um, you start to see the societal illusion at a very early age uh, with good old Saint Nick here um, being a, a, a very important part of uh, conditioning the American mind. Santa Claus is the first lie we tell our children. It is an illusion that we actively play in our society, and he is everywhere. To a child, Santa is very real. The child cannot mount a logical defense to the propaganda, and therefore it's accepted as truth. Think about the process for that illusion becoming reality in the child's mind. An authority figure tells you the story. The story seems plausible. Presents and candy do show up out of nowhere. And if you go along with the story, you'll be rewarded. The authority figure gains from the sense of superiority and justification for their actions. So um, while a parent or a government um, is able to tell a lie, they then also start to feel that um, they are superior to that person or, or you know, to the child or a citizen um, and then it gives them more justification to continue lying to them. This allows them to uh, control over their subject to manipulate them for the authority's advantage. So let's look at other forms of societal illusions used to control you for the advantage of some other elite. Just remember at the top of every illusion there's somebody that is profiting from it. The American Dream. We print the world's reserve currency. We can create unlimited amount of debt. And we're 5% of the world's population using 25% of the world's oil and up to 50% of some of the world's commodities. Your vote counts. It's not who votes that counts, it's who counts the votes. Uh, that's Joseph Stalin. In our elections we're given meaningless choices, a controlled media, real debate is limited, outsiders marginalized, voter fraud, Freedom of the press. Six corporations control 97% of what you see, hear, and read. Equal justice. Uh, here's a skit from uh, Dave Chappelle to kind of lighten the mood. Um, but it goes into a, a great comedic way of looking at how there's separate uh, classes of justice depending on who you are in society. So Dave takes a, uh, uh, a crack dealer uh, who gets um, middle class justice and then gives the middle class guy uh, street justice and how they're too um, prosecuted. And yet uh, what Dave does miss is that there's a group of elite who never are put on trial, who are never uh, even challenged on their crimes. Um, so let's, let's watch this clip. How was work today, Charles? Oh, same old, same old. The county's complaining about us misleading the stockholders and blowing the employee pensions. I mean, what a bunch of babies. I mean, come on, this is business, people, mm -hmm. right? And speaking of business, yeah. Satchko, take a powder. And you! Never <laughs> <laughs> <Enough of> money! <laughs> I was 
Jack Hain. I'm Detective Charles Stevens from the Dade County Police Department. I've got a warrant here for your arrest. A warrant? Charges cocaine trafficking. And, uh, frankly, I, I'm afraid I don't know how to handle it. Oh, man, we gotta be careful with this. We don't want to embarrass somebody like me in front of my family and my community. I'll tell you what. I'll come in and turn myself in around uh, Thursday, okay? Is one o'clock good for you? Oh, no, that's no good for me. I got some trim coming at 12. I turn myself in, say, between 2 and 6. Thank you so very much for your help. And again, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Oh, no problem. One love. Uh, yeah, I, I love you too. So what am I charged with? Yeah, like you don't know, you little bitch. <laughs> uh, could you do me a favor and not smoke? I'm allergic. Oh, well, hey, I'm sorry, Chuck. Why don't I do you a favor and put it out there for you, huh? Ah, I want to catch this punk. I want to talk to my lawyer. He wants to talk to his lawyer. Legal aid, you're on. Sorry. I feel like my 14th case this week. Somebody take a piss in here? <laughs> it was me. Hi, Pete. compliment you gentlemen on a very classy bowler ass spread with cheeses that I've never even seen before. <laughs> and my apologies for being late, but I got caught up with some puna <laughs> Well, so, it's like I said, we don't want to make a big deal out of this thing. You're a cocaine dealer, but you've done a lot of good for the community. Oh, I know, man. On Thanksgiving, I'll be passing turkeys out like Nino Brown, baby. <laughs> but seriously, we have to do something. How about you testify before a Senate committee and spend two months at Club Fed? When I get out, can I still traffic rocks to the community? Absolutely not. <laughs> you're, you're right. Selling rocks would be wrong. <laughs> Jail's the <laughs> Anyway. He points the gun at us, and he tells his dog to sick us. It was at that point that I fired upon the canine, and we were able to subdue Mr. Jeffries. Upon further search of the mansion, we were able to locate this. Pure Colombian heroin. Yeah, wait a minute, Your Honor. I don't know whose heroin that is, but it certainly isn't mine. Then his wife threw her titties in my hand. It was weird, Your Honor. You grabbed her titties. I saw you! Before I sentence you, is there anything you'd like to say? Okay. First of all... All right, that's enough. You're the worst kind of scum on the face of the earth. You're an animal. A filthy, big-lipped beast. I'd like to congratulate the jury of your peers for reaching a verdict. Ten minutes is a new court record. All your possessions will be seized immediately by the court, and you will receive the mandatory minimum of life in prison. Plenty of time to lift weights and convert to Islam. Now get out of my sight, you. Sir, is it true you were a crack cocaine dealer for seven years? I, I plead the fifth. <laughs> Sir, will you tell us about the cartels you dealt with in your time as a crack cocaine dealer? Um, no, but I can tell you that I plead the physics. Exactly how much money did you earn in your time as a crack cocaine dealer? There. I, I said there are so many amendments in the Constitution of the United States of America. I can only choose one. I can only choose one. I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. Five. One, two, three, four, fifth. Anything you say, fifth. Go ahead, ask me a question. Did you? Fifth. 
have a secret document that I think you need to say. <laughs> Thank you all, sir. Good afternoon. I got your sentence reduced to a month. Buddy. Oh! <laughs> so again, that's uh, the genius, Dave Chappelle. Um, again, pointing out the the double sided nature of our equal justice system. Um, one thing that I, I I definitely do want to bring up is that. When you start to see the amount of um, the statistics on the the amount of uh, prosecutions by race, um, and then the progression of how many people are arrested, how many people get uh, um, trials, how many people get prosecuted, uh, the terms, um, the 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 jail sentences that they have, the punishment, the people that get off on parole. When you see all that, and you see um, black versus white. Uh, forms of justice um, it's an incredibly disparaging fact and that's one of the reasons why I have been pro death penalty my entire life but when you start to see that a government can be so corrupt so blind uh, so systematically um, in prosecuting um, these people um, I much rather side on um, um, you know people being innocent and and being able to have have the ability to um, uh, you know, seek real justice um, by, you know, allowing them to, uh, you know, appeal or, or get off. Uh, I'd much rather that than having a government be able to dictate the lives of people. So, you know, while it may seem odd that, uh, you know, Mr. Conservative uh, voted for Bush twice, head of the college Republicans, is not pro-death penalty, uh, I try to hold that cognitive dissidence, and when I question everything, uh, that was one of the things I, d I did question. Um, and you cannot help but when you see the facts um, that there is two forms of justice uh, for for uh, black and white people. And either we should have all the white people be prosecuted as the same as the black people or all the black people uh, prosecuted the same as, as the uh, white people. But until there's equal justice, I don't believe that there should be um, a death penalty in this country. And plus the fact that I, I do believe that there is in redemption and for those that are really, really, uh, you know, committed these horrible crimes, uh, I think life in prison is an alternative that we, with no, with no parole, uh, is something that, uh, is a viable option. Um, and just in case those people are innocent, uh, or were prosecuted by, um, a government that, uh, you know, benefits off of it. Uh, the dollar is another societal illusion, probably one of the biggest ones that we're going to learn about uh, throughout everything. Um, it is fiat money-based system. We will get into that in module uh, five. Um, and this will affect, when I talk about this paradigm shift that is coming, um, every single transaction, everything that we do in our, in our world, uh, every contact we have with people relies upon the ability of the dollar to have value. Uh, and this paradigm shift will happen when the dollar actually becomes worthless. Um, all of our, all everything that we've come to know will change based off of this illusion coming to an end. Religion is regarded by the common people as true, by the wise as false, and by the rulers as useful. Seneca, 50 A.D. Religion is one of the most oldest forms of control in society and is sometimes stronger than nations. In Christianity alone, there are over 38,000 denominations. Which one is the true God-chosen one? The Mayan elite use their knowledge of the solar cycle to manipulate the masses. To sacrifice more for the elite, their labor, their assets, their lives.
These are the day of great lament. The land thirsts. A great plague infests our crops. The scourge of sickness afflicts with us at a whim. They say this strife has made us weak, that we have become empty. They say that we rot. The great people of the banner of the sun, I say, we are strong. We are a people of destiny. Destined to be masters of our time. Destined to be nearest to the gods. Mighty Kukulkan, whose fury could scorch this earth to oblivion. Let us appease you with this sacrifice to exalt in your glory, to make our pe people prosper, to prepare for your return. Warrior, unafraid and willing, with your blood to renew the world from age to age. Thanks be to you. Now watch how the mass of people are sacrificed for the elite and that there's a propaganda class in front selling and whipping up the, the crowd into a fury and selling them a story. The Mayan elite knew the solar cycle and used that story to manipulate the masses for their own power. And when things went bad, they didn't take acceptance for it. They merely said that the gods were angry and that more blood, more sacrifice was needed out of the lower class. Do you see the same dynamic that is played over and over again? And while it seems barbaric that we sac that the Mayans sacrifice their people you know through beheading and, and blood sacrifice what are we really doing in our own society when politicians get up on stage and feed us lies that they know are lies to sell us to war as we send young Americans into a battle based off of a lie to gain more power for them Or what about these classic American illusions? Deficits don't matter. Housing prices always go up. We can spread freedom with force. You can get something for nothing. We no longer need to manufacture things. Savings and capital investments do not matter. The rest of the world will continue to take our IOUs. American labor is inherently more valuable than foreign labor. One generation consume, can consume and stick the bill to the next generation. The virtues that made America rich and powerful are no longer required to keep her rich and powerful. Wolves in Sheep's Clothing The tree and its fruit. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. A good tree produces good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. 
Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. And that's Jesus. I understand how, I do not understand why. George Orwell Another big handicap most people have is that they feel that they are good and they transfer their goodness onto others. There's a story I often like to tell about uh, a young couple that moves down to Florida and they go to see a real estate agent and one of the first questions they ask is what are the people like in this town? And the real estate agent asks them a question. What were the people like in the town that they had just left? And the young couple said that the people were really nice, uh, family-oriented people, uh, very trustworthy, uh, honest, and um, you know, just in general, very happy people and that they hated to leave. Uh, and the real estate agent says, well, you're in luck. The people like that in this town are exactly like that. A week later, another couple from a different from this from a different area came to the uh, the same realtor and, and asked the same question what are the people like in this town and the realtor asked the couple the same question back uh, what were the people like in the town that you just left and the second couple said oh the people that we um, that were in the town that we lived in were you know backstabbing and gossipy and and um, you know, just really nasty people, and we're really happy to to be uh, out of that area and, and move on to a different uh, life. And the real estate agent said, "Well, I hate to tell you that, but the people here are exactly like that." And um, the moral of the story is that you hang around and attract um, the same type of people, no matter where you go in the world. Um, and unless you inherently change, uh, your circumstances will not change. The people that you associate with will not change. Your physical setting may change, and you can move from state to state and, and look for a different life. Uh, but if you want to start a, and make a different life, you have to do it in yourself. Um, and the secret is that good people inherently will attract other positive people. And negative people will inherently attract other negative people. You've heard the term misery loves company. Um, well, that's the way it is. The problem with that is um, good people are then, be, uh, are then transfer their goodness because they see good in people. They assume that everybody else out there is exactly like them. And we know from cases like um, just because you would never do evil things does not mean other people will not. And, and we've seen that perfect example with Scott Peterson. Um, I think the, one of the reasons why this story resonated so much in, in the media and in the public um, is that this guy, you know, was a good-looking guy from Modesto, California, which I'm assuming is a very, you know, upper-middle-class uh, town. Um, and this guy killed and murdered, um, you know, his his wife and an unborn child. Um, and you know, I, I looked at uh, Lacey's parents um, and, and her friends, and the the shock that they felt uh, that somebody could be able to do that. Um, but I think deep down, I think what bothered them the most was that they actually trusted him, um, and that maybe there were warning signs that they saw, but tended to ignore because they felt that they were good people, and and and, and, uh, and passed that along to Scott. So that's what this little chapter is about. The foundation to all mental illness is the unwillingness to experience legitimate pain. Um, if you've ever gone into a therapy session and uh, you know, you know, fought through uh, depression or um, a pain um, that has plagued you for your life, um, one of the first things that the therapist usually end up doing is saying, you know, would you like some pills to you know, get you back to where you were or just to smooth out the rough edges and stuff. And uh, that is the worst thing you could possibly do if you're suffering from depression or, or uh, any of these things because it, it, it'll numb the pain and never allow you to work through what God has intended you to do um, to struggle through 
um, that pain until you come to some sort of mental uh, uh, res resolution. Um, and people will do anything not to experience the, the pain that it takes to go through that, uh, that process. And that is the very foundation of mental illness. The people who um, don't go to therapy to work through it healthily with a professional or the people who uh, then take medication to go, to go away the pain, um, they, they're developing uh, a mental illness by doing that, whether uh, becoming numb to the world emotionally uh, through medication or uh, building a narcissistic bubble um, which they create to uh, defend their ego. Hurt people hurt people. Um, again, in therapy, uh, one of the first things that they'll also go through um, is that when you are hurt from somebody, um, you have to realize that that person that did the hurt is hurt themselves. Um, somewhere along the line, that um, negative energy is being uh, passed upon because that the, uh, the predator in this case was a victim at one point. When people deny pain, we form mental delusions, justifications, and rationalizations to protect the ego. These delusions shut down emotions in order to protect the ego from the pain, and in turn, shuts down emotions for others. It's a very important point. Um, all these people who are, um, you know, predators out there, um, they're emotionless. You know, if you've seen you know these these criminals that get pulled in they 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 don't have an emotion you're not dealing with a, a full person there 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 there's definitely something missing um, and they and they do this because they've been hurt somewhere along the line um, and they they have learned by avoiding that legitimate pain to protect their ego by shutting off those emotions mentally physically um, emotionally um, in their brain so that they don't feel the pain so they don't get hurt again but the side effect is that they shut down emotions for others as a result these people lack empathy and view happiness not through emo the emotional involvement of friends and family but they tend to seek it through the material wealth and control over their environment through the manipulation of others so you start to see the development from a, a person that was uh, mentally, physically, morally injured uh, early in their development, they became hurt, they shut down their emotions, which in turn shuts down the emotions, emotional involvements of others. They also seek to control their world uh, to not let that uh, injury happen to them again. And it also now makes for a person who wants to control the world, control others, and lacks empathy for anybody who gets in their way to control their environment and they have this mental uh, delusion that's in their head um, and you start to see the uh, genesis of a either a criminal or uh, you know just a, a, a person who uh, you know seeks to you know spread pain and we have all met people like this in our lives people that have hurt us used us or even fooled us in our personal lives, it's very easy to get them out of our lives. Um, you know, just leave them. Tell them to get the hell out of here. Tell them you don't want to have anything to do with them. That is the best way of um, of dealing with these people. Um, you know, we've all heard the stories of the girlfriend that had the bad boyfriend that um, you know that uh, you know abused them, and it's you know it's a drama back and forth. They're back together again. They're not. Um, the only way to deal with a person who has these uh, characteristics is to just not associate with them. That's the best way to do it. It's a waste of time, energy. Um, your life is too short to be dealing with people like this in your life. And, and I hope this chapter helps you identify these people um, so that you're able to move on it and, again, be emotionally free from, the, um, from these toxic relationships. But where do these people go? Um, you know, you always hear these stories of, you know, people moving from the Midwest and they go to the big cities. 
um, there is a reason for a majority of these people to leave their hometowns and go to these nexus points of New York, Washington, and L.A. Um, these are, I, I've noticed in my own life, uh, my my wife excluded, who moved uh, from Cleveland to New York, and that's where I met her. Um, a lot of these people have these tendencies where they have um, more or less burned their bridges with a lot of the people in their hometown. Um, maybe they don't quite fit in because uh, you know the Midwestern people are uh, much more grounded, much more uh, your your um, your reputation means a lot more. And these people seek maybe the um, maybe power. Uh, maybe that they've burned their bridges around in their own hometown and that they're seeking that new life, uh, just like that real realtor story. Um, you know, they don't like the people where they're from because they don't fit in because they're, you know, maybe immoral or they've, uh, um, you know, people have just had enough of them. And But where do these people go? And it's an interesting point because it starts to now develop a, a national psychosis that develops. Um, if these people leave the Midwest and, and um, are, you know, go to these nexus points of New York City and Washington and LA, um, these are now power centers of our different parts of our economy. And we'll, we'll see this a little bit later, uh, but New York is the head of um, the financial um, area of our, of, our, of our country. Washington DC is the head of our political uh, foundation of our country. And, and LA is the, uh, the, the uh, nexus of the social and um, social power of our country. Um, so depending on where their interests are, whether it's politics, money, or, or, uh, or media, uh, these people who are been told to get the fuck out of, uh, you know, people's lives tend to navigate to these areas. Um, and then it starts developing into this next nexus of, um, where do they proceed up? And now that you have a group of these people who have been hurt, uh, seek to control others, lack empathy for others. Um, we then start to see a national uh, threat to our country developing, and they seek power. Not um, they seek power over others, most often in positions of power, no matter how small. Um, so we've all met authority figures that seem to revel in their power over us, and this again could be anybody from a, you know a, a government worker at a at the post office to a, a principal. Um, all the way up to a CEO, president, senator, um, banker, um, movie mogul. Definition of a psychopath. A person with an antisocial personality disorder manifested in aggressive, perverted, criminal, or amoral behavior without empathy or remorse. Psychopath is a, a very derogatory word that has been um, um, abused, in, I feel, in our society. Um, this is the actual definition, and, and the people that we were discussing before, the, the hurt people that hurt people, fit the very definition of psychopath. Now, there's very many different extremes uh, of it. Um, it could be uh, somebody who has amoral behavior without empathy or remorse, or it could be a mass murderer. Um, and this is also maybe known as a sociopath. Um, that's a, a kinder term to it because psychopath tends to, um, you know, bring up this media image. Deep down, we know if we did something wrong. Um, our internal emotions, our, our, uh, our, our moral compass will tell us if we did something wrong and we struggle with that and fight through that um, and it's through um, experiencing that pain and understanding our our insides will tell us you know that we need to correct something that we hurt somebody that we need to do the right thing and fix it you know we lose sleep we feel sick we wrestle with our emotions and psychopaths do not have that problem they can commit antisocial activities and sleep like a baby. They lack empathy for anyone, much less their victims. And they have built a bubble in their mind that justifies all their actions.
Are media created images of psychopaths? Hannibal Lecter, Psycho, uh, Christian Bale, an American Psycho. And these are put out there um, to reinforce um, that in our minds what a psychopath is. Um, and yet these type psychopaths are extremely rare in society. Um, you know, making up one one hundredth of a percent of our of our society, um, and that they're the most extreme of uh, uh, perverted people in that psychopathic thing, and yet it's estimated that ten percent of our population suffers from these uh, um, that are psychopaths, sociopaths, um, that are people that have no emotions for other people. So they're a lot more prevalent than, uh, than they're made to think. While these are all true vision, versions of psychopaths, again, serial killers are extremely rare and have very few victims. But there is a more common psychopath that preys upon our society. The modern psychopath, Bernie Madoff, uh, people of his ilk um, are the are this are psychopaths, um, and we need to identify these people. Um, and I'm going I'm to give you the tools necessary to do this. And this is very important for um, you moving forward in your life and also in the academy um, to be able to identify these people. Um, so then you can either stay away from them or take them on. Because of Bernie Madoff's um, actions, his $50 billion fraud, his entire life of lying to people, uh, stealing, thieving, creating uh, an illusion, a bubble in his mind, um, it resulted in uh, more than one, a handful of suicides of people whose uh, fortunes were entirely lost to this criminal um, psychopath. There was over 4,000 direct victims uh, that their entire life savings were wiped away. He stole $50 billion. Entire family fortunes were lost. And hundreds of thousands of indirect victims. And yet, he has no real remorse. Uh, I'm sure he's sad now that he's been caught, um, that his game is over, and he may sh put on the crocodile tears. But if you look at this picture right there, with his smirking, cunning look, um, you can see that at that time he had no remorse because in his mind he had developed a bubble where he justified his actions. Um, and it's through that mental illness, that psychopathic, uh, cunning behavior, that he was able to pull off this crime without losing sleep, without it affecting his outer personality um, that would have tipped off other people. Um, there is the modern version of the psychopath, and this is much more prevalent. Um, there's much, uh, much more prevalent in society, and I want people to understand that because this could be your financial advisor, this could be your lawyer, this could be your um, the teacher of your kid. Um, you have to be able to identify these people um, to stay away from them. That's the best way of dealing with it. Um, but if you do identify with them and you're involved in their lives, or they're involving themselves in your lives. Uh, you may have to confront them. I'm sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Again, that's Jesus. So how do you identify psychopaths? You can see it with this aggressive narcissism. Um, I, I, once I had learned this, I was able to go back in my mind, all the people, um, that had hurt me in my lives and in, in my life and able to put, you know, all of these characteristics, if not a majority of them onto them. And had I known that these were characteristics, uh, ahead of time, I would have disassociated with myself, maybe never even started a relationship with them or ended relationships earlier, knowing that these people will never change. 
Um, and that that's an incredibly important part. Uh, there's people in my life that I spent years of emotional energy trying them, trying to get them to be good people, do the right thing. Um, and yet these people, because they build this bubble up in their mind, um, think that they are, uh, you know, that only they are right. Uh, and they will never seek help. Um, they will never seek either therapy, um, you know, working it out with other people. Um, so it's very important to understand that they're not worth their time. They're very dangerous, um, either financially, physically, or, or mentally or emotionally, uh, and that they they're, should be shunned. Uh, but so let's look at some of these uh, characteristics. Uh, glibness and superficial charm. Um, you think about these people, um, the way that they get their victims are that they put on this face of, uh, you know, being very friendly and nice and, uh, and it puts people's defenses down. And that's a, a very important first characteristic of these predators. Uh, they have a grandiose sense of self-worth. Uh, uh, most people are attracted to people uh, who have this grandiose sense of self-worth. Uh, they're, they're interesting to watch. Um, you know, they, they're, they're out there. They're, they're the fun people to be with. Um, pathological lying. This is very uh, an, uh, an odd thing to try to pick up. Um, you will notice that these people will start off with a little lie. Um, and most good people don't challenge others when they, they first sense this lie. They, they say, maybe it's something else. They'll give any justification other than the fact that this guy is a pathological liar. So it's important that when you hear a lie um, and you know it's false, um, challenge these people or at least put that a little checkbox in your mind that this guy lied about something else and maybe that I shouldn't uh, open myself up to this person. Uh, the next thing is that they're very cunning and manipulative. Um, they tend to put more thought into the manipulation of others as opposed to maybe um, solving a problem themselves. Um, they, they don't they don't want to do the work themselves but if they can find ways for other people to do it for them uh, that uh, tingles their senses. Um, and again it comes into the controlling their environment, controlling others uh, because they were hurt and they don't want to be get hurt again so that's the nexus, that's the beginning genesis of, uh, of that uh, idea. They lack remorse or guilt. Again, they can commit antisocial activities, anything from pathological lying to stealing to even murder. Um, they can do it because they, they've shut off all their emotional energy in their body, um, and then they don't feel any emotional feelings for themselves. They don't love themselves, and therefore they cannot love somebody else. Uh, they're emotionally shallow. You cannot have, um, it's physically impossible for them to have an emotional relationship with anybody. Um, and, and a good thing is like you, you'll see people, um, you know, who are going through tough times and maybe open up to this psychopath. Um, and you know, where, you know, a really good friend would be, you know, feel their pain, understand what they're going through, you know, offer them advice, um, you know, maybe give them just a hug. Um, if you identify this psychopath, you'll see that they'll go, okay. All right, that's that's nice, and and maybe end the conversation kind of uncomfortably. Um, that is another warning sign. Uh, failures to failure to accept responsibility for their own action. Um, this is another great point. Uh, you know that if they do something wrong, it's never them. Uh, never, never accept responsibility. It's always somebody else. Um, you know, it, it, things went against them. Somebody's out to get them. Uh, but it's never them uh, because they, that doesn't fit their uh, their 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 psychopathic psychopathic nature. Uh, they're again callous and lack of empathy. So that's that's a pretty good image um, that they put on the face of the the sheep that that looks like you, but underneath that there's a wolf there um, seeking to um, prey upon you. And again, it could be anything from uh, you know, just a, a bad boyfriend, you know, that's trying to prey on you emotionally or, or physically um, to the to the modern guy of Bernie Madoff, to the global elite that, uh, you know, commit much larger crimes. 
The Mask of Sanity was a really eye-opening book. Um, in order for psychopaths to function, function in society, they mimic um, they mimic their victims that they that they wish to be friends with. Um, in order for a predator, the wolf, to prey amongst the sheep or or, or people, um, they have to put on this mask of sanity. Um, they have to physically look the part. They have to uh, mimic uh, the other people that they seek to um, to prey upon. And they have to do this, and this is important to understand, because if they don't, if they show their true face, their their psychopathic nature, their, their lying, their shallowness, um, their warning signs, and that the sheep and the people, the sheeple, would uh, stay away from them and never allow the predator into the flock to, for them to prey upon. Um, and this is something that predators will develop uh, very much so. Um, this acting the part. Um, in fact, they you know they say L.A. is a very shallow society. Well, there's because there's a lot of these psychopaths, sociopaths, um, that are able to turn off their true self and act the part. Um, so actors would naturally have the uh, you know the ability to do that. And again, I'm not saying that all actors are are psychopaths, but it's that same physical act of changing your persona. You've seen like the really good actors um, who then who are not themselves in different roles, and they're able to physically morph them, morph themselves and and get into the role. Um, and if you think about a psychopath, they get into the role um, by mimicking the people that they wish to prey upon. So they act perfectly normal on the outside, but underneath there is a tremendous psychological disorder that is stirring about and that is very dangerous and that this, I hope this chapter uh, provides um, you the tools necessary to identify these predators. So narcissists and psychopaths often use this knowledge to gain confidence with the intended victim. So again, here's Scott Peterson and Casey Marie Anthony. Uh, Scott Peterson's the one that killed uh, Lacey and, and uh, the pregnant um, uh, wife uh, with his child. Um, and then Casey Marie Anthony um, uh, killed uh, Kaylee, uh, that little beautiful little girl. Um, and they both did it for their own narcissistic uh, feelings. Uh, Scott wanted to have uh, an affair uh, wanted his pregnant wife out of the way. It was all about him. Uh, he wanted his own satisfaction. Um, in, in this case, sexually or you know, definitely not emotionally with somebody else. Um, and that his you know loving wife and child were going to stand in the way of that. Uh, Casey Marie uh, wanted to party and and uh, you know get drunk. And again, that sexual um, nature of her was being hampered by her daughter Kaylee um, and and took in both of these predators these psychopaths took out their uh, most extreme nature and actually plotted to murder their loved ones and their children um, in order to satisfy their own psychopathic nature so narcissists and psychopaths often use this knowledge to gain confidence with the intended victim um, so you know, think about all the people, the normal people that were friends with these um, two psychopaths that were utterly shocked uh, when these crimes were committed. And yet, if they saw um, what we're teaching in the Sons of Liberty Academy in this chapter, um, perhaps, um, you know, they could have uh, at least stayed away from them, but um, maybe help them to seek, uh, you know, help. Um, you know, chances are, in my experience, that very few of these people ever seek help. Um, but may have uh, buffered the the extreme of their uh, behavior. They mimic the victim's values, image, tone, and interests. Uh, so they'll. Um, I, I've known people in my life who, um, you know, buttered up to you or buttered up to an important person in in your life. And uh, you know, you almost seem like they they uh, when they come into somebody else's life that they almost. Um, you know, entrance the intended victim with, uh, you know, kissing up to them, that being overly, uh, you know, maybe hardworking if that's what the uh, intended victim um, interests are. 
Um, and, and you'll see that over and over again. How many times have you heard the interview with the neighbors after some crime that he seemed like a normal guy? Um, that is the mask of sanity that these psychopaths uh, purposely work on uh, to gain confidence and gain trust of their intended victims. These predators lack empathy, love, and compassion. They seek only self-gratification and see others as only a means to an end. Again, there's no emotional victim, uh, no emotional victim in their mind, um, and that all these people that are in their lives are merely tools to seek their satisfaction. They come on strong. They shower the victim with compliments, and once they're an item, the roles switch to cut downs to keep their victims insecure and unstable. So again, using that uh, bad boyfriend um, uh, analogy, um, you know, you've always heard of these relationships. The the boyfriend comes on very charming, uh, maybe very entertaining, um, showering you with uh, you know gifts and and um, you know kissing up to the parents, um, and then as soon as they're into the relationship and that the the predator has gotten what he wanted, which was the you know the girlfriend or you know sexual intimacy with this person. Um, then it switches to another role where they they want to. Uh, control that victim and they do this through saying you know you're you're not the person I fell in love with so the, they're very moody they go from um, love you and can't live without you to you're not the person I fell in love with and then back to love and this you know emotional seesaw and breaking up and all this other stuff warning sign red flag get out um, don't be involved with these people because it could at the extreme end up like Scott Peterson or, or Casey Marie. This is a, a great um, tool that I've developed um, is watch how they treat others in public. Um, these psychopaths um, again view others as uh, a means to an end but watch how they treat people who they have uh, who they interact with that they cannot possibly gain anything from or are interested in gaining anything from. So you could go out to um, you can go out to uh, uh, dinner with these people. Watch how they treat the waitresses. Um, you know, do they they treat them rude? Um, do they maybe not tip them well um, over some slighted uh, uh, perceived slighting? Um, you know, watch how they uh, you know deal with children. Um, you know, if they don't lack emotional energy, if they don't have emotional energy. Uh, holding a child is not an experience for them. Playing with a child is not an experience for them. While they may do it to, um, in the early phases to get everybody to see that they like it, um, watch how they deal with with them. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, also, watch how they treat former relationships. Now, this could be either in a, um, a career setting um, or the, this could be in a uh, relationship setting. Um, but if they know, if they've been down that path, these psychopaths been down that path in either a career or a relationship, um, and that they treat them, you know, dog-like, you know, like they they could care less about them, they talk down about them. Uh, understand that you are potentially that next person that they are uh, going to be talking about this way. And then finally, older people. Um, again, all these people cannot possibly serve to advance their um, their desires because uh, the psychopaths tend to um, look upon other people as a means to an end either financially sexually um, controlling and older people and children and and past relationships and and you know random people like waitresses don't fit into their mind of that they could use them to advance their satisfaction so a great key insight um, could possibly save you years of you know anger you know anger and pain and therapy and medication and and uh, you know unhappiness. Um, very important stuff here. And again, here here are the the victims of those psychopaths. Um, so again, you got uh, Lacey here and uh, Kaylee. Um, you know, two obviously. Uh, healthy, wonderful, you know, in, in Kaylee's case, you know, growing little girl um, that were abused by 
uh, these psychopaths. So here are some common psychopathic delusions uh, that they are superior to the victim, um, that they deserve whatever they want, that everybody else is crazy or wrong, uh, that they have delusions of grandeur, that they're much bigger in their mind than what they really are. Um, another thing that they'll do is, why don't they just listen to me? You know, that's a common refrain uh, from a, a lower level psychopath that's struggling with understanding why the world doesn't go along with their little bubble. Um, that it that their actions are just a means to an end. They try to uh, lower the importance of what they do. If they, um, you know, if they're, um, you know, plotting to do something, it's just because the the end justifies the means. Uh, might makes right. Um, you know, if they're a, an aggressive, uh, powerful uh, psychopath, that they, they and they, they're able to, um, you know, establish. Um, you know, might onto the situation, might makes right. Um, and then in the case of these Wall Street guys like Bernie Madoff, they're just separating a fool from their money. Um, again, not looking at the emotional implication of the victims, uh, life savings being wiped away. But Bernie Madoff is nothing compared to the true elite that commit global crimes, including mass genocide, generational slavery, and the theft of nation's wealths. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. So that's former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Um, and you, you see as the reporter uh, is asking the question, she, you know, is very almost emotional about it. You know, she gives that little, uh, little breath there going, you know, uh, half a million children have died from the uh, sanctions in, in Iraq. And, you know, that's more than all the people that were killed in, in you know, the atomic bomb. And that, you know, these are real lives and that there's a lot of pain and if, it, if it's a half a million children, you know, logic would dictate that there's, you know, one or two or three or four million victims um, emotionally that are scarred from their children dying uh, because they couldn't either get food or water or medication or, or whatever, um, that the uh, emotional distress upon that population is, is in, you know, incredible. And the psychopath, Madeleine Albright, um, you know, says, you know, it, it's, it's, it's worth it in their mind. Um, and it is because it, it by, um, um, instilling those sanctions, uh, it advances, uh, the, our, our elites aims, um, to control, uh, that population or to control the oil, uh, to control arms sales, to control Saddam, to control the Middle East, uh, to control our way of life. And they're able to, put aside the emotional uh, pain of those millions of people over there um, uh, to justify their actions here. Um, and what we do personally, um, what these psychopaths do in our own little lives, um, as these psychopaths advance in either the, the, the New York, Washington, or LA nexus points, um, the more powerful they do, uh, the more victims that they can have worldwide um, and by enabling these people and not identifying these people and not calling out these people and not limiting their power um, massive amount of energy emotional energy uh, physical energy financial energy is lost to these psychopaths as they prey upon society um, and as we go through the the academy I will point out more and more of these people um, and this will change the way that you look at things. Um, and I know will be a, a, a huge help to you, even if it's just a personal relationship, getting out of a, an abusive relationship and giving you the, um, the, the, the emotional energy to say enough um, and that these people will never change and to stop um, trying to make things right with them because they never will. Wake from your slumber, but first you must die. 
Man is free at the moment he wishes to be. Voltaire. And we talk about um, the six freedoms, the uh, intellectual, the political, the physical, the financial, the emotional and spiritual freedom. Um, and that's what this whole academy is about, um, is becoming free. And as soon as you are aware, you can prepare for this. And that's why I, I hope even early on in this process that you start seeing the bigger picture uh, and that you're, once your mind is expanded by a new idea, it will never go back. This will be a change in your life. Um, because once you're exposed to these new ideas, you're able to think, um, you know, uh, new, newer ideas, and you're able to uh, expound upon that. Until they become conscious, they will never rebel. And until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. This is a quote from uh, George Orwell in 1984. And this is something that the elite understand, and that's why the academy is so very dangerous to their way of life. Um, because we are making people conscious, uh, and they, they, are, they will rebel, um, you know, either personally or financially or politically, uh, maybe even physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Um, they will never go back to the way that they were. Um, and by you finding this, by you... Um, getting involved in the academy by you financially committing to the academy um, you feel that there's something wrong in the world and and that you were you know you understood that there's something wrong and and you weren't fully conscious of it and you haven't fully rebelled against it but the the seeds were planted when you just felt that uncomfortableness um, and again let me just read this to you until they become conscious they'll never rebel and until after they have rebelled they cannot become conscious um, so this is a huge step um, in, in, in doing that. You need to be able to recognize a paradigm shift. So we see that the, our way of life uh, will come to an end um, and that everything that we've grown up accustomed to will change. Um, you know, I feel it's going to be with the, the, the destruction of the dollar, uh, the ability for the United States to import all this oil so cheaply. Um, our military power, our financial power, our manufacturing power gone. Um, America will not be recognizable in 10 to 10 years. Um, you have to develop the ability to question everything. You have to understand cognitive dissidence and doublethink. You have to understand societal illusions and be able to see through them. You have to understand that there is an elite that owns and controls our reality. You have to understand that there are psychopaths, that they're much more common, um, that they tend to seek power positions, and that, uh, you know, and you have to be able to identify them. I will show you how the world really works. The elite's entire playbook and how to defeat them personally and globally. How the elite have become tremendously wealthy and how we can take advantage of that knowledge to create wealth for ourselves. And the idea at the end of the day is to become truly free and independent, that total freedom that we're talking about. But first, your old self must die. We cannot become what we need to be by remaining who we are. Max Dupree. So some of you have seen this, and I actually took a college course called Death and Dying. Um, it was an eye-opening course, and um, one that I, I, I got value out of, but I don't know if it's something that, uh, um, you know, I would want a lot of people to go through I guess because it kind of numbs you to the emotional pain of death and dying um, and um, but there, there's five stages of grief uh, and it, they were created by Elizabeth Kubler Ross um, and there we all go through these things and it's important to understand them um, and then when you're going through uh, pain and grief um, you'll be able to, it'll help guide you that, okay, this is what I'm feeling. Um, this is the stage I'm in. Um, this is normal. I need to go through this pain. 
um, and then I'll, I'll come out a better person at the end of it. Um, a lot of people tend to stop this pain um, because they don't like the, the pain that they're going through during the grieving process. Um, and, and again, either seek antidepressants, abuse alcohol, um, abuse drugs, or worse, form that bubble in their mind of uh, emotional shutdown. Um, and then that's the creation of um, psychopath. So the first stage of any you know, grief, you know, whether somebody dies or um, a financial loss or a you know, pet dying, there's shock and denial. Uh, and you'll see this with either avoidance of the issue, not talking about it, confusion about the issue, why did it happen, uh, fear, um, oh my God, what is going to happen, and then blame, um, you know, the finding, finding, trying to blame somebody for that, for their pain and taking it out on them. So the, there's that initial shock and denial. Uh, some people will just be shocked into numbness and uh, people just actively try to stay away from it. And you need to embrace it. You need to go through this pain, trust me. Um, it's very important for your mental health to go through it. It's, uh, it's part of your life. Seek people who have that uh, emotional um, energy to help you through it. The next stage is anger. Um, after the shock is worn off and the denial is uh, started to confronted, um, you'll feel frustration, anxiety, irritation, or, or even shame that you were a, a victim um, or that you know something happened. The next step is Depression or detachment, um, you feel overwhelmed and helpless. Um, and this is again, your brain trying to um, go through the process of, of rationalizing what had happened and finding uh, meaning for what had happened. Um, and your brain will get tired of the anger and, and can no longer put out the emotional energy of the anger and resentment and irritation and shame. So then what it'll do is it'll shut down, it'll get depressed, it'll It'll stop um, trying to process all that anger um, thing and allow it to relax. But by, by doing that, you feel hopeless. You feel empty. You feel, I mean, that this is the worst part of it because it's, um, you feel like it will never end. After you get through that, your brain, you'll get tired of the depression. You'll try to bargain. You'll try to find any way of getting through this. Um, and this is an important part because then you'll start reaching out to others. Um, but for most people, it's reaching out to others just to tell one story. Um, and again, this is a natural process. People will start talking about, um, you know, a death in the family, a financial loss, a, um, you know, somebody, you know, abusing them. Um, they'll reach out. And this is or the natural way of finding those emotional people to talk to. Um, this is the time that you should be reaching out to, the, to, to these people and, and hopefully that there's a, um, you know, an emotional person who's, uh, willing to be able to get involved in your personal story and help you with, uh, you know, either love or, or compassion or, or, you know, advice to be able to help you through. Um, because quite honestly, if they get involved earlier in the process through that shock, anger, and depression, um, they won't. They won't be talking to anybody. They're, they're, they haven't naturally gone through there. Um, it's important for those people to be there for them. Um, and th again, this is a, a great tool for for you to, it, when you're going through it. But it's I think more common tool for you to be able to help other people with it. Um, and it's important to see that really, you know, giving all this love and compassion and stuff. While it's important to be there for steps one, two, and three, um, the advice the 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 comfort the you know real dialogue cannot start until stage four and then finally uh, if they're able to healthily go through this process there's acceptance um, uh, and they'll start exploring new options and starting a new life plan um, you know you, you see the the mothers of uh, you know the girls that were you know kidnapped or murdered or stuff like that they they go through this entire process and um, you know, they always start these foundations and to help other people and that they're dedicating their lives to this cause or, um, you know, people who, you know, say their mother died of breast cancer, they start, uh, you know, campaigning for that. Um, and it's that acceptance and that's the starting of a new life. And it is a great time for this person, um, even though they've suffered tremendously, to be able to go out and help other people. Um, and that, to me, is one of the most powerful things that we can do 
um, as humans is to be able to um, take a pain and be able to give an answer. Um, I certainly have felt this um, and observed this in people and I, I saw a tremendous amount of pain in society that did not need to happen. We're not meant to live this life. Um, we're not meant to live the life of a rat race. We're not meant to live the life of, of debt, of being struggling, um, you know, on any, on any of these levels. And that total freedom happens um, through this education process. Um, and, and it's my hardest time was just before I started this academy. Um, and through my grieving process, I gave... Um, you know, the answers that I, I researched it, I felt this, I explored it, I, I you know, plotted it, I, I put it in order, and I put it in the way that I would want to learn it, um, and that you're feeling, you know, an answer that was caused through me going through a grieving process. But let's, let's, uh, let's interpret this five stages of grief to you, old, your old self dying. Um, when you go through this academy, uh, if you really fully are involved in it um, and fully accept it, you're going to go through your own dying process because the old you will die. Um, and I want you to be aware of this process as you're going through this educational experience. Uh, I told you from the very beginning this is a life changer um, and it is a process that I, I feel if, uh, if I'm able to communicate this well enough, uh, that you'll probably go through the exact same stages that I went through. Um, when you learn all these truths, um, you're going to feel depressed about this. So let, let's let's apply these five stages of grief to the Sons of Liberty Academy. Uh, the first, there's shock and denial. Um, so the things that I'm going to be telling you, um, people are going to say, "No, nah, it's just it's a conspiracy," or "It's impossible for that to be that way." You know that, that there's the shock and denial. Um, an unbelieving nature of what I'm going to present to you in the academy, um, you're going to have that initial shock. I hope that you're able to um, at least suspend disbelief and, and go along through it um, and be able to trust me as I've done this. I've done a ton of research on this. Um, I've done the bullshit test. I've, I've uh, you know, weeded out the, you know, the... the you know the wacky you know aliens live here in uh, 2012 Mayan calendar type stuff uh, planet X I, I I've explored all those things and um, I'm, I'm not gonna present that stuff to you in, in this but um, if you ever run across anything that I, I present to you that you disagree with um, you know m just move along okay next there will be anger um, if you do understand these things uh, you're going to, you're going to feel that, you know, I can't believe I was so wrong that you were fooled. Um, you know, people, you know, I tell them about the, especially the financial thing. I think that's what bothers people the most. Um, I think when people see the missed opportunity in their lives and if they only knew then, uh, what they know now, um, you know, that it would have saved them, you know, maybe a divorce, maybe a, a relationship, uh, you know, they can't believe it. you. You got to get again. Just move along. Um, and there's the other people that uh, you know that that are going to look at this elite group that is actively screwing with our lives um, and want to act out in anger against them and saying, you know, those elite fuckers are going to pay. Um, that is not an answer. Um, you know, one of the things that I I get into is that um, I'm a firm believer of civil disobedience and non-compliance. Um, so, you know, I am not a proponent of a violent revolution. Um, anybody who is offering that idea, um, most likely is a federal agent looking to set you up. Um, but at the very least you could be dealing with a, a, a psychopath who is looking to commit a crime. Um, but it is definitely not the answer. And I want people to get past that, uh, as they go through this academy, because, uh, we're going to come up with much better ways and much more effective ways of changing our world. Um, and that it does not involve a, a violent confrontation of any sort. Number three, there's depression or detachment. Um, another thing that uh, people feel when they go through this academy is that it's just way too big and that these people we're dealing with are way too powerful. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, they deal in a reality uh, the same way that we do. Um, and just as they're able to manipulate uh, masses 
we will be able to uh, wake up those masses. The same tactics and, and uh, mindset, the, uh, the same process that goes into uh, putting people into a trance, uh, there's the same, uh, the, you know, the antidote to that um, of waking them up. And the best part is, it's just telling the truth. Um, it, or it's, you know, it's just getting to the back to the Constitution. If you want to limit world, uh, the new world order, just get back to the Constitution. This isn't brain surgery, um, you know, and, and, and waking people up. Once people see the truth, once that mind is expanded by a new idea, it can never go back. Um, and that's the best thing about this is once you go through this academy, you will never fall back into this trap. You'll be wide awake to this entire uh, blueprint of deception um, and you'll never be a victim again. Um, and then the other thing that people do is, you know, what can I possibly do? It's, it's just too big. Um, I have a great plan of advancing not only the academy, um, but we can take this to a much larger level. I've, I've thought this through to the end. Um, and, and in my mind, um, the end is another American Revolution. It, I don't believe it'll be a violent one, um, but it'll be one that will have the same emotional, um, physical energy that was involved with our founding fathers, um, and that this can and will be done. Uh, the fourth stage is bargaining. Uh, this is probably the most annoying stage for, for people who are, uh, are related to people who have woken up to the truth. Uh, you, you, you become a truther and you want to talk about, you know, like 9-11 to everybody you meet and, you know, ruin parties. I certainly went through this. Uh, I have been a buzzkill on many parties. Uh, you know, I tended to come across as this very serious guy when people are just trying to relax. Um, I've moved beyond that. There is hope for you uh, if you're in this stage. Um, and then there's people who go around and spam the Internet to awaken people. Um, I, I know that was one of the things that I was doing, I was going into, um, um, you know, video game forums and trying to wake people up there, uh, uh, Rotten Tomatoes, which is a, um, uh, uh, website that's dedicated to movies and, and again, trying to spread truth through there. It's, it's a waste of time. Um, you know, don't bother doing that. I have, I found much more effective ways of uh, reaching out to people. And then finally there's acceptance. Um, and, th and that's where I hope to get you by module 10, uh, where once you're aware, then you can prepare. Uh, that's the tagline, the, the, the whole start to finish of, of the academy. And once you're aware, you can start preparing for that, um, you know, either physically or, or mentally, emotionally start changing your life. Um, and that's the stage, these five stages, I hope you go through as your old self dies, your your sheeple self, your, you know, your gullible self uh, dies. I hope that you are able to go through this process um, and it's natural. Recognize it, um, move through it, and you'll come to the end, I hope, by module 10 um, and that you'll be able to, um, you know, move forward into your new life. And that's when the real excitement starts in my mind because once you've gotten to the end, um, the, the world is your oyster, the world is your possibility. Um, anybody who is able to con fully take control of their mind uh, is able to take control of everything else that's justly um, they deserve. That's that Andrew Carnegie quote from before. When I started down this road in 2005, I spent thousands of hours reading hundreds of books and searching late at night on the internet. I was obsessed by this. I... Um, I tease my wife that I'm glad she stuck with, through with me because, uh, you know, I was up at four. In fact, I'm up right now at four thirty in the morning recording this, um, and I hope in my mind when this project is done that I can return to a much normal life. Um, but I'm just absolutely obsessed in um, getting this message out, and um, you know, I I know that this is what I'm meant to do. Um, but I was, I was uh, frustrated that there was no central place for honest info. Uh, when I was on the internet, I kept going to, I'd pick up one uh, new thing and I was like, wow, that's great, I want to learn more. And there was no central location. That's why I came up with this academy. I took everything, trust me, everything that I've uh, researched over five years into this and I put it into an orderly fashion. Um, and it's, I've, I've, again, passed the bullshit test with me. Um, you may not agree with everything. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly willing to debate uh, and modify anything that uh, 
you know, turns out to be false that you find in the, econ uh, in the academy. And I, I want your feedback because um, I really do want to open up people's eyes. Uh, no one made a complete picture. And again, that's what I've offered in, in the academy. I, I don't not only detail um, problems, I detail the genesis of the problems, the history of the problems, the um, how they do it, um, and then also offer answers on many different levels. So um, I hope that you see that in this academy. Um, through your own private research, there, there's just too much distraction, disinfo, disorganization, and they, people tend to get frustrated and lost in this process. Um, and I, I feel the academy is all meat. Every slide that I've done um, is packed full of information. I did 1,776 PowerPoint slides. Um, each of them are, you know, I think artistically, visually stimulating. Uh, mentally stimulating because every slide has a new idea, um, a new point that's that's put out there. There's no uh, filler that's in there trying to just kind of beat your brain into a, a one one idea. Um, I present an idea and I move on. I don't you know present an idea and then spend the next nine slides saying you know that idea is right, that idea is right. Um, there was also no plan of attack out there. Uh, there's a lot of this information. There's a lot of money to be made into the scaring of people, but there's no um, money to be made into the uh, answering. Um, you know, I've said before that I know that there's a cure for cancer out there, uh, but there's much more money uh, involved into the um, fundraising for cancer. There's much more money into the uh, prevention of cancer. There's much more money in the treatment of cancer, but there's not that much money in the cure of cancer because if that was the case a multi-billion dollar industry um, would be put in it, put to an end um, and it's not in the interest of the elite to provide that to the massive amount of people um, and again every aspect of our life is owned and controlled by some sort of elite who profits perpetuates um, off these uh, you know paradigms that we live in Over the next few modules, I'm going to give you everything I have. All of my deepest research, how we are controlled, who controls us, why they control us, a detailed history of their crimes against humanity, their modus operandi, their weaknesses, and our strengths. And then divining the future and giving a clear path, um, a clear way out for you and your family. Why am I doing this? I felt trapped in my life. I felt like uh, I had been played like a puppet. I feared having my freedoms or wealth stolen. I wanted a better life for my kids. I wanted to fight this fight alongside fellow patriots who understand this um, process. And I, most importantly, I wanted peace and justice. I wanted peace in my own personal life and justice for the elite that have committed all these crimes. Why now? We are at a cusp of a new world. Either a new era of enlightenment and freedom or a new dark ages of slavery and war. I really believe when this paradigm shift, there's no guarantee that the United States will be the way that you remember it. There's no guarantee that the United States will exist um, and that we could slip into a feudalistic um, you know, dark ages, so to speak, of tyranny. Um, if if this country is not able to w awaken itself um, and really make the tough decisions that it needs to make. And again, the Sons of Liberty Academy, I feel, is a great first step in, uh, in waking up these people um, and providing the nexus point um, for people to move towards enlightenment, uh, education, and freedom, total freedom. The only one who is wiser than anyone is everyone, Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, and while I have put it in a ton of work, and I really feel this is a top class product uh, that I put out with this academy, um, I do not believe that I have all the answers. I, I struggled uh, to find and, and refine the best product. Um, 
But at the end of the day, this is not about me. It's about you, and it's about us, and it's about our future, and it's about our children. Um, so while you have bought into the academy, you are an owner of the academy. Um, and I, I fully want feedback, um, um, n new ideas, new concepts. I hope that uh, we're able to grow this. Um, I would love to have people create more modules uh, like these modules that you're seeing now um, that are more about their skill set. I, you know, I'd love uh, for somebody who's, you know, further down the road on, uh, you know, maybe uh, knows more about guns than I do, knows more about farming than I do, knows more about uh, uh, food storage than I do. Um, you know, I would love to be able to put these together and, and partner with you and promote um, these uh, educational materials out there in the market. And again, to bring this module to an end, um, when you are aware, you can prepare. Uh, this first module has been about laying the uh, intellectual foundation for the rest of the academy. All those uh, skills that you just had learned, uh, the cognitive dissidence, the identifying psychopaths, the um, you know, double think, all these things that we just went over, um, those are the tools that you need to um, you know, stop the, the, the process now um, understand them, get them into your body a little bit because they'll help you consume um, the next nine modules and trust me it's a long road ahead of us. Uh, this is the shortest module. Um, I have I think module 10 is a, over eight and a half hours long um, and it's a, it's the most inspirational one I, I feel um, and you know certainly go through this um, with the knowledge that you're gonna feel these different emotions that we laid out with the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, five stages of grief and um, you know take notes um, share this with other people sit down with people rewatch this uh, video with somebody that you care about um, you know take notes on it discuss it uh, maybe form a, a group about this but um, this is the beginning of something and I, and I hope that uh, you, you know, take the time to do this because this can and will be a life changer um, thank you very much